flowers, either wildflowers or what we wrongly assume as weeds, are really, really good to bring the wildlife of pollinators into your garden, but also create that habitat for things like your frogs and your uh, hedgehogs and, and so on to, to hide in and, 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 and breed in and so on and produce food for. So this, this hedge, beautiful native hedge, and the planting underneath is a great example of thoughtful wildlife gardening. So I've put some domestic plants in here left over from my garden or split from other gardens. So we've got some sedum in here, which is great in the autumn that gives a really good pollination. We've got some domestic geraniums that I've managed to split and split again. There's some grasses, we've had daffodils, we've had alliums in here early on in the season, as well as self-seeded bluebells and all these sort of safe self-seeded, what other people would consider weeds. So the alkanet, for example, uh, often confused with borage actually, but has this beautiful blue forget-me-not type flower, which is a great pollinator. It can run riot in your garden, so you do need to keep it in check. We've also got the campion at the back that has just started to take over, and you can see now that's alive with sort of insects and bees and you'll get the moths in the evening. So by putting those flowers in and around your garden purposefully, that will help to bring in and sustain wildlife in your garden. So when we're looking at wildlife gardening, we need to think about water. Really, really important for the dragonfly, the damselfly, the frogs and the newts that will help keep down your slug population. We're lucky enough to have this beautiful big pond here, which is kind of the focal point of this allotment. But you can make a pond in a sunken trug or a sunken bucket. You've just got to make sure you've got a clear and easy way out for frogs, for newts, but also for badgers and for hedgehogs. They can all drown if they haven't got a safe way in and out. Plenty of planting, you should always plant native wildflower and pond plants in my opinion because there's such a beautiful range but you're looking for probably 60% cover of your pond in in sort of green planting in order to to have a healthy pond uh, that will sort of sustain wildlife garden loosely stand back and just let nature come in so at the moment on my uh, broad beans i've got some black fly on but that doesn't worry me those black fly will be eaten off fairly soon by the birds that are all around they're not disturbing the fruit they're in fruit now so let everybody enjoy that we're not mowing very often if at all so we do need to keep it reasonably low because then we make sure we've got access for everybody but we are trying to reduce the mowing in the community spaces and then and letting some places completely go over to wildlife. You've got to have a bit of a balance between, you know, nettles and brambles and dock and that wider range, because while those three species are great, they can create a monoculture in your, in your community space, your allotment. So you need to tend to that in the same way as you would a flower bed or a garden bed. Um, but let things come naturally, watch them for a season, see if they'll flower, see what it does for the wildlife and see if wildlife likes it. Think about creating habitat for uh, this wildlife as well. So if you've got a shed, for example, you could put bird boxes on it, or if you've got a taller shed or building in the eaves there, you could have places for bees or even swifts if it's a taller building. Uh, bug hotels are a great thing to do, particularly with young children or with community groups. You can stack a few pallets and put all sorts of different things in there, reclaim bricks or tiles or straw or some rotting vegetation. will create great space for wildlife to come in uh, and, and inhabit and so they're a great thing you can do with children. Over winter leave piles either of open compost or open leaves and twigs. You could put three canes in the ground together and make a wigwam and stuff that full of all of that sort of dead and dying leaf matter and then put some string around that to hold it together and you can have those dotted around your allotment. Open compost heaps are a really good way of, of creating habitat for wildlife. So we've got ours just with pallets strung together and those open compost could be uh, home for mice over winter frogs and toads will find some warmth in there and and hibernate and because it's open you'll also get all sorts of bugs and creatures and the birds will come in and forage within that so think about what's naturally around but also start to create some of those spaces to encourage the wildlife in So if we think a bit about sustainability, which really works hand in hand with wildlife friendly gardens, 
Um, think about being organic, so not using any pesticides and any chemicals, either as a fertilizer or as a pesticide to kill those bugs. We've talked about the importance of that food cycle and allowing nature to come in and help you with that. Water butts are a really, really good way of being sustainable. Just rig up some guttering on the side of your shed or your boffy, or you can rig it up with a piece of corrugated material and just a freestanding piece of guttering to collect that water. And if you don't have that, you could have large buckets. I've seen people just have baths out in the side of their allotment that will collect water and you can use that as a dunking tank. So collecting water and using that rainwater is really good for your plants and really good for the planet. Now you can't buy uh, peat-based compost, which is absolutely fantastic. But when you're buying plants, they can still be sold in peat. So when you're buying plants, if you are buying plug plants or fruit plants, try and shop locally and try and go to your local nurseries and growers because they have grown that themselves. So you know that will A, work really well in your local environment, B, there's zero or very low miles in terms of its travel. And you're also investing in your community around you with that um, by helping other growers locally. You don't need to tackle everything at once. Take it bit by bit. Choose an area that you want to grow on. Get that well clear of the invasive weeds so you can grow in that area. Think carefully about what you want to grow. Maybe start with some fruit or maybe you're going to start with some peas or some beans. But start small and build up from there. Talk to your neighbours, talk to the surrounding community. They will be full of advice, local knowledge, what works well, what doesn't work well. They'll know about your soil. They'll know about the, the pigeons or the weather or you know what's coming in and, and might affect your crops and your growing. So get to know your neighbours and the people who have been growing often for many, many years. Get your community involved if you're on a community space, have some work days, have some fun parties. You can clear a lot of ground and you can plant a lot of plants if you've got that people power, if you've got a few people that can come together and help you with that. But the most important bit is just enjoy it. You will have failures, I have failures every year. There's some stuff, I've grew some sweet corn, it's a disaster, it hasn't made it to the plot you see. That's fine, it doesn't matter, it cost me a few seeds. So enjoy enjoy your space and also don't aim for perfection take time to enjoy that moment to enjoy your space with the wildlife in your garden <laughs>